Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Rouge Free Will Baptist uh, Online Sunday School. This is, uh, my name is Charlie, I should tell you, and I'll be here today with my wife, Rhonda, and we'll be your guides through the book of Revelation as we're with the church of Thyatira, uh, the fourth church. And we're in, of course, if you turn to your Bibles, you'll be in Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. And I just want to say good morning to all of you and glad you could join us. For, and thank you to all of you who are in other parts of the country who have gotten up even an hour earlier and it's eight o'clock your time. And so we're happy to have you on here with us today. We are doing a very exciting study. And so this has been quite eye opening and I hope that you're enjoying it. And again, uh, if if you are joining us this morning and you would like to be a regular part of this and would like to receive the outlines, all you have to do is message me. You can friend request me out here on my Facebook page and I will accept you. And uh, Or you can text me or message me, however, and send me your email address and I will get those outlines out to you so you can keep up with us. It's wonderful to see you all this morning. We have really some great stuff to look into today. And so uh, I just pray that uh, God will bless our study, open up his word to us, and help us to understand better uh, what has been happening in the past ages, what is happening now, and what will happen in the future. And that's what we really look into now with, the ch with this church because this church is the church that uh, not only what they're going through at that moment when you're in about the year six, 606 AD to uh, about 1520 AD, and Jesus is talking to John in, uh, in about AD 90, and he is telling him what is happening with the current churches, but he's also looking into the future and prophesying that some of these events that are going on in the church here are going to bring about events in the future. And so we have seen, as we've gone through this so far, how we've gone from the apostolic church, the church of great evangelism, to the church that was persecuted, and then you go, uh, which, and then on to these churches that start mingling their doctrine with doctrines of the world, and we start looking at the very beginnings of what could be conceived as a one world church. And that certainly was what some of the emperors of Rome had in mind at this when they start going into this. We're going to talk about some very controversial issues today. Uh, I promise you I will not have all the answers today. But what I will promise you is that whatever questions you have, I will get you the answers uh, because with you know through my historian over here, my precious wife, uh, who is just uh, awesome at this ancient history. So let's dig, get get into it. All right, now, I want to have prayer with you, and I do ask you today uh, as a personal favor to please remember my sister-in-law Brenda in your prayers this morning. Uh, Brenda has been in the hospital several times. She has some very serious issues, not just one. She has actually several serious issues. And last night uh, at home, she went non-responsive and was taken by ambulance uh, to the hospital where to, at this moment she is in, in ICU and on a ventilator. So we are praying for her and my brother uh, both of them have really suffered a great deal these last few years, especially. And so, you know, for their kids and all of this is such an emotional turmoil. And they're doing the best they can to manage the situation. But it's very, very difficult in this kind of situation. So let's pray to today and we're going to pray for Brenda and, and we're going to pray for God to really open up the word of God to us. All right. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence today, we are thankful and grateful to God for, you, for your love and your mercy and your kindness. You're such an almighty God. You're so gracious and loving. But Lord, as we come to you this morning, 
We do pray, Father, for Brenda, and I ask you, God, today that the love of God and the mercy of God will just be shed upon her, Lord. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will reach into her room and touch her. I pray, God, that you'll lift my brother up and give him strength and sustain him. And for her children, God, and her grandchildren, I pray, Father, that your blessings would be upon them and that you would give them the peace and comfort and, Father, that they need to get through these next few days. I ask you, God, to bless Brenda. God, if it be your will, I just pray for a healing for her, Lord. But, Father, I do know that your will is perfect. And I know, Father, whatever happens, whatever you do, it'll be the right thing. And I just place my trust in you. And I place them in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, folks. All right, let's... If you have your Bibles, now, again, for those of you who may uh, be joining us lately, uh, we, are, we are looking to and using uh, the works of Reverend Clarence Larkin, who probably is the greatest authority, even though he wrote back in 1919 uh, his book on Revelation and the book of Daniel and the book on Dispensational Truths. His work today is still highly regarded as, as the best that you can find on the situation. Uh, he spent 25 years of his life not only uh, going through the book of Revelation and researching it and getting us information on it, but he was also an incredible draftsman and made uh, fantastic uh, drawings and art of his studies, which I've shared with some of you in your outlines. We're also following Dr. Tim LaHaye, who wrote his uh, Unveiling Revelation in, 19, in 1999, but he used a great deal of Dr. Clarence Larkin's uh, research in his writings. Uh, other than I will tell you that the reason we're following Doc, we're really following Dr. LaHaye's writings right now closely because he had much, much more to say about the seven churches than did uh, Dr. Larkin. And so he is using uh, the NIV for most of his, as he's going through his work. And so that's why you see much of the text that I'm using are from the NIV version. But I always keep the King James version with me nearby so I can make sure that we're staying credible. Although I do really do trust uh, Dr. LaHaye that, on that situation. Uh, Clarence Larkin would use the King James version uh, he would also use the American Standard Version, which came out in 1901. So those are the, and, and, th and as far as translations, those are probably three of the most trusted ones uh, in the world today. Although I think the American Standard Version now has a new American Standard Version. So, but that's kind of where we're at. So just in case you're looking at your King James and you're wondering, well, the words are a little different. We've, they've been translated a little bit to help you understand, taking it out of the old English into a more common American language. All right, so let's get started. Uh, when it comes to the pronunciation of, of this church, trust me, I've got, uh, we've, Rhonda and I have tried three or four different apps and got three or four different pronunciations. <laughs> so, but again, that just simply comes from the ancient language and into more modern language. But uh, Thyatira seems to be the one that works the best, although it's not the easiest one for me to say. I always want to go to Thyatira. But so if I go bounce between the two, that's why. All right, so a little history um, that I'll share with you, and then uh, Rhonda has some things that she can share with you. As far as we can tell, this, uh, this city was founded by Alexander the Great about 300 years before Christ. Uh, it's a wealthy city. Uh, it, it is in Macedonia. It is, again, located, all seven of these churches are located in the, what we know today as modern Turkey in Asia Minor, and they're no bigger than the state of Pennsylvania. But these seven churches have very uh, deep meanings, and these and have their seven different locations, and a lot of different things are happening to each church, as, as especially as the Roman emperor, starting with Constantine, starts to try to build a universal church, 
where he's going to take that apostolic Christian church, mold it with a Babylonian mystique, and the uh, what will be the Church of Rome that will turn into later the Roman Catholic Church. So, it is, they are, uh, they are known for their outstanding dye colors. That is their manufacturing base. It is believed that this church was probably founded by Lydia, who was one of Paul's converts in Philippi, but she was from this city, and you see, she was the, um, you know, the, you know, the, the lady with maker of purple, right? The seller of purple. The seller of purple. Uh, so, it is believed that once she gets converted in Philippi, that she comes back home and evangelizes and and starts the church in Thyatira. It is also believed that she got a lot of help or um, maybe a great deal of help from the church of Ephesus in starting that. So the main characteristic of the church is works. They're very big on works. Now, Rhonda, you got some other historical stuff on this, like what kind of city it was. You want to come over and take over the chair? Now, I'm making her take over the chair here, you know, so you can see her when she talks. I could stay behind the camera, but um, Thyatira was actually created as a, um, an outpost in the beginning, a protector for the city of Pergamos. So their, their primary, in, in ancient times, their primary function was to make sure that if there were any invaders coming in, that they held them off long enough for messengers or you know, harbingers to get to the city of Pergamos so that Pergamos would not fall. Um, but it was a very um, uh, pagan society in the beginning. Um, they had a temple to Apollo, which is... Uh, in the in the Greek, the son of Zeus, his favorite son. In the Roman, he would be the son of Zup Jupiter. Um, his attributes, according to mythology, and again, this is mythology. When I use the word God, it's small g, not not capital G, like the true and living God. But um, the attributes of Apollo were um, he was a healer. He was the known as the uh, sun god, sun s u n, not s o n. Um, and he was also the god of prophecy. So one of the major things that happened um, for the people who worshipped Apollo was that um, they would go to a place that was called the Oracle of Delphi. And if any of you know the history, this is supposed to be the place where you got your prophecy from, um, given directly from Apollo to this oracle who told you what to do. And it was really... Um, I don't know how to say this politically correctly, so I'm just going to say it. It was a manipulation of the people. Um, it was just another way in, in a pagan religion to manipulate. And uh, when I was reading this, I found, you know, and it never jumped out at me before. So things are always, every time you read the Bible, it gives you something new. And in the beginning of this, this study on Thyatira, um, Jesus identifies himself with one of his attributes that have already been talked about before. And this time with Thyatira, he identifies himself as the Son of God, and that's capital G. And I think that's because, you know, Thyatira so, so easily identified with Apollo, um, the son of Jupiter. And he says he has eyes like flame and feet like fine brass. And both of those things harken back to, you know, Apollo was the sun god, but the son of God is the true and living God. He is the light that lights up heaven. We will need no lamps. We will need no anything because he is the light. And um, feet like fine brass, that's because of all, I think, and this is my personal opinion, you know, there were trade guilds going on in Thyatira. They were known not only for their color dyes, but they were known for fine bronze work, fine uh, metal works and things like that. And so he's telling them that, you know, all of your works are nothing because I am everything. And um, the city, unlike Ephesus and, and Smyrna and some of the others, has never been excavated. It is just outside the new city. It's just now a pile of rubble. Um, nobody has bothered to excavate this. And I think that really speaks to what Jesus says in this chapter as to what he will do 
um, and what he can do and what he did do. So that's the little history of Thyatira um, talking about these trade guilds. You know, Lydia had built this church. Um, Christianity was really taking off in Thyatira. But in order to do your work, and it kind of reminds me of today, compromise had to come in. You know, to do your work, you had to swear allegiance to um, either the papal uh, uh, form of worship or you had to bow to the pagan form of worship. So um, that's kind of the history of Thyatira. And I'm going to give the seat back to Charlie because I'm not as good at this as he is. <laughs> Well, that sounded pretty good to me. And uh, okay, thank you, and thank you, and thank you, honey. I appreciate that. And and so, and I'll bring a few other things out to you. One of the important things is that she was telling you what the situation was, especially current day. But this is going to lead into future events too. This church and the actions of this church will go right into what we call the tribulation period. You'll find out that our Lord will say that what this church d did and what they're doing and what they're going to do is going to stay with us through the ages right into the tribulation period. So this is really our first church that brings us in so far into the future events is to actually go beyond the rapture of the church right into the tribulation period. So let's read from the scripture, okay? So... Uh, I'm reading from the NIV. Uh, if you have your King James, so do I. And I'm, but I, and and you can kind of compare what he says. But I'm going to read to you right now from the NIV, and here's what it says: To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write: These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire. <clears throat> and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. That is speaking into the tribulation period. Unless they repent of her ways, I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. That means, for one thing, that the true church, the church of Jesus Christ, will be raptured before the tribulation period. Those saints of God will not be made to go through the tribulation period. That's just one of the verses that leads to that. Except to hold on. Now listen, this is really important. To hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious or who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so this is really important and you've got to really, and, and, and I'm going to paint with a broad brush because I don't, on one hand, I, 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 there's some things I have to say to you that are really tough. But on the other hand, I don't want you to generalize and you're going to, because you're going to see 
later on as the study goes, uh, that Christians will come out of that. Well, how's a good way to put this? They will hold on to their denomination, you might say, but they will not reject Christ. So they won't follow the pagan teachings of that day. So, and hopefully that you'll understand that statement just a little bit better. So if you put lay your King James alongside the NIV here, you can see that there's not a great deal of difference other than the difference in language. That's it. The old English uh, to the American. So here we go. The pagan church. This church uh, is taking place. It's, it's going on as John is on the Isle of Patmos. And he is being uh, spoken to by the, by the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the revealed, uh, resurrected, and, uh, he is, and he is Christ unveiled. He is Christ as he really is. And he's speaking to John. And while he's doing that, this church is going on, as my wife just told you, all the uh, things that are going on, the trade guilds, uh, all of the unions, and that's what guilds are, basically unions, and all the things that can happen. At the same time, you've got this Christian church that's sitting here in the middle of all this paganism. You've got the Roman emperors who are trying to bring them all in under one roof to create this. And the word Catholic simply means universal. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there, and you'll see that as you kind of go along. Uh, Pergamos and Pergamum, you can see where uh, Constantine has really brought the churches under one place. And paganism and the old mystery of Babylon, we're starting to get into and infiltrate the Christian church. So they still believe in Christ, they still follow the scripture. But now they're doing things such as rituals and sacraments that are pagan. And I don't know any other way to put that. I try to be kind about it if I can, but sometimes I can't. And we're going to see. We investigated some of that last week, and we're going to investigate it more this week. So here's the, here at, the Lord commends this church, both presently and and in the future, because this runs right into the tribulation period, and this church, what it represents in time, is what we know today as the Dark Ages. He says, I know your deeds. I know your love and your faith, your service and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Now, that's in verse 19. Then he condemns them for this. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now, you might as well put right there, you compromise with this pagan worship who brought Baal, the worship of Baal, into Israel. You are putting up with the same things and compromising. Who calls herself a prophetess, but her teaching, by her teaching, she is misleading my servants, and she's bringing them into sexual immorality, and they're eating food sacrificed to idols. Now, he counsels them, and he says, hold on to what you have until I come. Can I stop right here? And let me tell you something. That, and this is, um, you can agree or disagree with me. That's fine. It really, you know, agree, again, agreeing with me, and Roger Phillips says 87 cents will get you a cup of coffee at McDonald's. But there are things that the church has compromised and sacrificed on through the ages. And it is my belief that no matter how hard we try, now that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but I believe that no matter how hard we try, we're never going to get that back. And the command is, and you'll see this command in the next couple of churches, Hold fast to the things that you still have and fight with everything in you to preserve what's in the word of God. And that's what he commands them to do. Hold fast until I come and get you. Hold on to this. 
And so now the challenge he makes is this. And that, uh, that was in verse 25. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end. That's very important to the Christian today. We need to understand what the will of God is, and we need to be able to understand that we have to hold on to that. And he has revealed his will to us in the word of God. So I urge you that when the, you look at the word of God and it calls something out as sinful, or it makes it clear, and the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you through the word of God and makes clear to you that this is not acceptable in the eyes of God. You need to hold on, to, regardless of what the world says. I don't care what laws we pass. I don't care who's in power. The Christian today needs to hold fast to the word of God. And even if it makes you unpopular, then so be it. Because if you hold fast, he says, I will give you authority over the nations and he talks about that he will rule them with an iron scepter and dash their, them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him that overcomes the morning star. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So it is important that we understand <coughs> that the Christian, as the future comes is going to become less and less popular. And we are not going to be able to hold sway over the government. That doesn't mean we ought not try, okay? Let me make that clear. You ought to stand up for your beliefs. You should vote the will of God, and you should do everything in your power to hold on and hold fast to what the Scripture tells you. But I promise you, and all you have to do is look around you, folks, and we're going to get more into that, especially next week when we get into the Reformation Church. More and more, churches are compromising with the world, and we're going way out of our way to make the churches popular and accessible so that they'll appeal to the general public. But again, I beg you to listen to me on this. There is only one thing that draws people to the church, and that is when the church lifts up Jesus Christ. Amen. When you change everything you are to become acceptable to the world, listen to me, when you change everything that you are that was commanded to you in the scripture to appease the world or the government, whichever, you are going down a trail of idolatry. And just like, and, and I'm a firm believer, Pastor talked about this a little bit this week. I'm a firm believer the churches that you see that are not surviving have had their candlestick pulled from them because the Lord Jesus promised, if you don't do what I challenge you to do, I will pull your candlestick. I will take away your light and your power. So, here we are, the dark ages. We are beginning more and more now, uh, especially once Constantine comes in and starts mingling pagan worship and the Church of Rome with the apostolic Christian church. We are, he's not taking away the Christian faith, he's just simply adding to it. And you're adding things like sacraments, praying for the dead. We went through a lot of that, but we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. And the light that Christ entrusted to the church, that he gave to the church, has slowly begun to flicker out in these dark, dark ages. So, and won't reflicker again until we get to the Reformation Church, which is the Church of Sardis. So continuing, I want you to look at this list on page two. And again, I know, especially to my, to my friends out there uh, of the Catholic faith, and I want to tell you that I, I pray that you are not, even in your Catholic faith, and I know many Catholics who do not follow these, they're still Catholics, but they do not follow these. They worship only Christ. But you see some of the things that are brought in. 
So as you look at the list, we'll, and I'll ask. Debbie Lee Zach says, when you lift up Jesus, he will draw all men unto himself, and you don't need no bells and whistles to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. And that's true. And I, and I, I say that urgently. I say that because so many churches today are looking at other churches who they term to be successful. And I'm not knocking any churches, and there are churches out there that are of God, but they're looking at what they do and saying, well, maybe we need to change over to that. And maybe we need to try that. And I'm not, listen, churches evolve, and I'm not being, I'm not trying to, you know, to be like dyed in the wool set in stone here. Churches evolve, they do. Well, what I'm saying is when you take the root cause of what you are and you try to make the church about music, you try to make the church about personalities, and you try to or you try to you try to make it an event, and you put Jesus over in the corner and he's kind of like a an afterthought. You come here for this and we'll present Jesus to you. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says, lift Jesus up. He is the star of the show. Uh, you lift up Jesus, and when you do, he will draw all men to you. Because if you don't, if you go that route, and I'm again, I'm not talking about, you know, don't, I don't want anybody out there taking what I'm saying for their argument on their side. Uh, everything about church, music evolves. Preaching, the style of preaching evolves. It always has. The key is, is Jesus being lifted up? Is Jesus being worshiped and being praised? So let's kind of look a little bit, and I'm not going to explain all of these to you. However, if you ask, uh, Rhonda and I will try to compile a list of what they mean. But things like uh, the first pope really doesn't come along until AD 607. Now, if you read uh, about this and you see Boniface III, they tried to say that there were popes before Boniface, and there actually were, but they were of the Church of Rome. They were not of the Roman Catholic Church. They were of the Church of Rome. They were all highly disputed. Uh, and But what that is, is, and, is that the, the Roman Catholic Church tries to trace its papacy back to Peter. They believe that Peter was the first pope. And they use that verse... Upon this rock, I will build my church that Jesus said in reference to Peter, but not necessarily about Peter. And so they try to use that to run that this, that this universal Roman Catholic church went all the way back to Christ. But the truth is, it did not. The Roman Catholic church has a hard time tracing its roots any further back than A.D. 315. And we really don't get this first universal pope until about AD 607. But if you if you do if you happen to Google all that, you're going to find there are several several popes. But that's what they're doing. They were of the Church of Rome, and they were trying to build a linkage back to Peter. And the truth is, like for instance, they say that Peter is buried at the Vatican, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the truth is, they don't know if he is or not. We know Paul died in Rome. And we know Peter was taken to Rome and crucified. So we know he went there. But again, this is actually centuries before you actually have what is referred to as the Roman Catholic Church. So they really don't know if what they have is Peter or not. But they proclaim that it's Peter. Uh, so look, but look what happens here. Look what, as you start getting pagan worship in with Christianity, the things like kissing the Pope's feet was supposed to show that you're the servant of servants. That is the Pope's title, servant of servants. Uh, worshiping of images and idols. Holy water starts to being used. We start canonizing dead saints. And yet it's interesting that this angel, for instance, John starts to worship him and he says, no, 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 don't, don't, don't worship me. I am one of you. I am one of your brethren. Don't worship me. And yet, we start getting Kenna's, uh, fasting, celibacy of the priesthood. That is nowhere in the scripture. Nowhere in the scripture. 
uh, the Inquisition. This is uh, this was actually uh, the the Catholic Church uh, trying to stop the her what they called heresy between uh, among the Jews and the Muslims, and ends up being just they just go and so many and it goes on for years and so many people are killed under the watch care of you see why it's called the dark ages um the sale of indulgences where simply was if you had sin you could pay the church money and your sins would be forgiven or you could be brought out of purgatory so on and so on and on that list kind of goes but here's some of the ones that really i want you for instance in ad 12 29 the Bible is forbidden to lay people. And all the masses, we talked about that last week, start being conducted in Latin. They want the Bible and the whole thing to become a great mystery. So people, lay people, common people, do not have access to the Bible. And in the worship services, uh, they are just simply chanting. Maybe one or two words, because on the instruction from the priest, because they can't understand what the priest is saying. The doctrine of purgatory comes along. Uh, the Ave Maria is approved, which is a prayer to the Virgin Mary. And what's even worse about all this, tradition is granted equal authority with the Bible. So you see how they brought this in. Now, our traditions are just as important as the Holy Word of God. The things we've done in the past and the things that have been rituals that have been around for ages are just as important as the Word of God and are brought together, such as that. Honey, you got you can chime in and talk. No, you're doing good. Um, can you uh, talk to the folks about uh, the apocryphal, the word, the books that are added to the to the Bible? In the Roman Catholic Bible, there are extra books that when King James and his council uh, looked at the scriptures and tried to create a version of the Bible that everybody could read, um, they could find no no proof or no links to any, any how do I put this, um, any religious, any God-given... Um, Accounting this these they deem to be man-made written from a historical perspective not from a spiritual perspective So they were not added to the King James Bible However, the Roman Catholic Church because of the tradition you've got the book of Judith. You've got the book of the Maccabees, which is um, Historical data and is backed up by historical data, but is not under the divine inspiration of God Thank you. Look and so other thing like for instance, uh infallibility of the Pope is declared. Now, is that scriptural? Even, even the most novice Christian can understand that the Bible is clear. There is none good. No, not one. But this church declares the Pope to be infallible. So whatever he says, that's what it is. Whatever he interprets, that's what it is. And But as, uh, as laity, as common people, you don't have a say at all. Because first of all, you don't have a Bible. And second of all, you're considered too ignorant. This is again falls into what we call the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And I'm the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Uh, Mary, as the years go by, especially as you get into the 1900s, she is almost proclaimed as deity and in many cases, is worshipped above Christ. She's venerated. Yeah. So, and then she's, in, in, and proclaimed the mother of the church and the mother of God. So, well, we'll talk more about it, but you can, you can understand where I'm going with this. If Jesus is our Savior, and there's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved, how can possibly Mary be elevated above Jesus? And so, but these are a direct result of the apostolic evangelistic church being mingled with the pagan worship of Babylon. And that's what you're going to see throughout this scripture as more and more 
The church becomes more universal, and that's what it means. Catholic, it just means the Roman universal church. Everybody, every church under one roof, believing all the same thing, whether it's true or not. And that is the danger of this age that we're talking about here that ran from about 606 to the 1500s. But you can still see it today, folks. And even today, and we'll probably get even more into that next week, but even today, more and more, the goal is to get everybody under one universal church. And it's the same as it has been throughout history. If you can control the church, you can control the people. Debbie says, Mary was a humble servant of God with a great calling, and that's it. That, and, that is, and that is true. That is true, Debbie. And, but understand that this is what happens when you compromise. And, and the Lord is going to talk about this in one of his parables about the woman who takes a leaven, which always represents sin, and kneads it into the dough and mixes it so that she gets her bread that she's always had. The bread is still there. You haven't lost the bread but you have mingled in it the sin of the world. And so that is uh, just really important. So Rome's greatest heresy, and, that, and you know, I'm, I don't even have my, I'm looking. Oh, is it? What time? Oh, gee whiz. Okay, I told you this might take two weeks. The greatest heresy of Rome it, one of them is the, the word Thyatira itself means sacrifice and continual, continual sacrifice. This Church of Rome denies the finished work of Christ. You'll see again, and I mentioned it last week, I'll mention it again this. When you see a, the Catholic cross, the Roman Catholic cross always has Jesus on the cross, where the Protestant cross the cross is usually empty and is a symbol. But that is for a purpose. And that is because this church of Rome believed and promoted the continual sacrifice of Christ, where we believe that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again, appeared to, to people and then went back to heaven and is coming again to take us home someday. That is a heresy that, that, that Christ is constantly crucified. That is a continual sacrifice because what it does, it produces things like sacraments and praying for the dead and burning candles, all of that sort of thing. These are all borrowed from Babylon of ancient times. And that's why you've got to be careful with this. Uh, and, I, and I'm not being, I'm, trying, I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, hard-nosed about this. But my dad, once he discovered, and I told you he was a student of the book of Revelation, but once he discovered this truth, any cross in our house that still depicted a Savior on it was taken down. Now, I'm not telling you to go through your house, but I'm telling you, you need to think about what you're saying to people when you display a cross with a Savior on it. Because you are just saying that Christ is not finished. That's what you're saying. Tommy's comment is they, they crucify Christ afresh. Yes. And they, that's exactly right, Tommy. His, and what did Jesus say when he, before he died? It is finished. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else that needed to be done. So that's something that, that I really pray about. I can't tell you what to do or what to believe about that. I can only tell you what it represents. So that is something uh, that uh, between the false doctrines of the not believing in the finished work of Christ and believing in a continual sacrifice, all these are borrowed from, from Babylon. And the church eventually becomes more Babylonian than it does Christian. And that's what's going on. It falls into, heresy falls into two categories. One is when you have a false concept of the personal deity of Christ, and the other is mixing works with faith. There's The Bible is clear about you're saved by grace through faith. 
not of works, lest any man should boast, but this church continually looked toward their works. And you'll find that later on as you kind of go through it. And so you cannot earn salvation by works. You can be as good as you want to. You can do as many things as you want to do that are good. Paul said you could give your body to be burned. But if you haven't, if you don't love, if you don't have faith, if you've not been saved by the grace of God, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It will not get you into heaven. So these are what he's referring to as Satan's secrets that are in verse 24. Um, all these ideas. Is it, so one of the most dangerous trends of the 20th century in the Church of Rome is the elevation of Mary to just short of a deity. In fact, at one point, and it's still prominent today, the Pope has been petitioned for years to make Mary one of the Trinity. Well, who are you going to kick out of the Trinity to do that? But uh, it's not going to happen, at least not yet. But Jesus contradicts that when he says this in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You're not getting to the Father through Mary. You're not getting through the Father through any saints. You only get to the Father through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you can see what's happened to the churches and why, as we, as we travel on into the Laodicean age, our age, why it's so difficult for us to reclaim a lot of the glory of God because we have, as a church, have fallen so far. So that's what we're looking at here. Tom the, makes the comment, not by the works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So I have a question before you go on. All right. When you're talking about works, and, and so does that, that also go into... Like you go to the priest for a confession and the priest says, you know, recite this many Hail Marys and this many are fathers and you're going to be absolved. Of your, is that part of that work? That is part of that works. I, I, at least I believe it is because who is, who is our high priest? Jesus. Christ. Jesus. That's right. Jesus is our high priest. Right now, as you and I sit here, Jesus is fulfilling one part of his duty as, as, the, as the sovereign son of God. He is our high priest. He sits at the right hand of God, making intercession for you and I. So when I do something and the Holy Spirit reveals to me that I have done wrong or I have sinned or the Bible is, reveals to me that I have sinned, I can pray to Jesus and Jesus forgives me and presents my argument or my prayer to God and sort of cleans it up for me. So when God, again, when God looks at me, he does not see me because God cannot look at unrighteousness. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ applied to my life. There is no man who can forgive me of my sin. And that's also part we just talked about too, where you could literally pay. I committed this sin, but I'm going to give money to the church and I'll be absolved of that sin by the church. No, you won't. You can give as much money to the Rouge Free Will Baptist Church as you want to. And, and listen, we'll gladly accept it. You got a million dollars laying around you need to get rid of, you go ahead. You know what it's gonna get you? Nothing. Nothing. Because it's not given in love, it's not given with charity, it's not given with uh, kindness, it is given because you think you're going to get something back. And God won't bless that. Okay, so I, I so now here, this is Dr. LaHaye's story and, and going into some of those works where he traveled to a, what the largest Roman Catholic church in North America. And uh, we're running out of time because I actually wanted Rhonda to talk about this, but I may have her come back and talk about it later. But he's talking about some of the things that he witnessed as he went on this historical tour. And some of it is works, where people would get on their hands and knees and crawl across the concrete for hundreds of yards just to get forgiveness or to repent of their sin. 
And Jesus never asked you to do that. Never. No, no. Uh, and everything is shrouded in darkness and everything is a mystery. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you is there is no mystery in the church. The mystery of the church is, if there is one, is why Jesus would come to earth to die on a cross for a world that hated him. And the mystery, the answer to the mystery is because he, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you and I are on the same level with, with each other when it comes to God. He doesn't love you any more than he loves me. If you sin and you ask him to forgive you, he's going to forgive you. If I sin and ask him to forgive me, he's going to forgive me. But these are things that are brought in by Satan that mingle in with the, with the church of Jesus Christ and people swallow it. And they need it just like the leaven being kneaded into the dough. The sin gets entangled in us. And now through the ages, we have never been able to completely get it out. So. Heather quotes John 14 and 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Amen. And so I want you, I hope you'll read through that because he does bring out a lot of great stuff. Uh, and uh, but some of the things that and I'm running out of time and I got a long way to go. So this will take two weeks. I'm sorry, but I did kind of warn you it would take two weeks on this because there's so much here. Like the mystery of the church, if they they start mass, but all, all the masses are done in Latin and you don't have a Bible in your hand. And look, because the deeds of the Nicolaitans were that modern common man was too ignorant to handle or the Bible, or the scriptures. But it's done so it's mysterious, so that you have to listen to that one man who they say is infallible that is not Jesus Christ. But did Jesus say that? No! Jesus talked about hearing and understanding it. That's Matthew 13, 23. The word of God is meant for you to understand it. It is not meant to be a mystery to you. And if you will read, especially the book of Revelation, then you know, you know that the Lord is coming quickly, that his coming is right here. And you don't have to be amazed or surprised because let me tell you, it's if you are amazed and surprised at the coming of the Lord, you may not be going. We're to be looking, we're to be reading this book and to looking at the signs and see what God has done and what God is doing. Jesus could come any day. There's no, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. That's Exodus 20, verse 4. God strictly forbids you worshiping anything but him. So if you worship Mary, you're committing idolatry. If you worship Peter, you're committing idolatry. If you worship the Apostle Paul, you're committing idolatry. It is strictly forbidden. So ask yourself, how could the Christian church swallow this? See, that first church that actually saw Christ, or that lived right after he died and was resurrected, there is no way they would have given this up. But as the centuries go by, for somehow this makes sense to us. Especially when, and, and don't and, and let me let me let me give you some advice here on this before you get and before it sounds like I'm getting too hard on these people. These believers don't have the scriptures. Right. They don't. All they know is what's coming from that pulpit or from the Pope in the Vatican. And this is why it's important. And we talked about this last week. Satan can get somebody who is personable and wonderful and everybody loves him. And all he's got to do, because let's face it, as a Sunday school teacher, I can tell you there are people who don't want to hear me. There are people who kind of like to hear me. And there are people who absolutely love to hear me. 
I have a certain amount of followers. That happens with any teacher, any teacher, any pastor. It's up to me as a teacher to help you understand that instructions for the church come from your pastor, not from me. If you're listening to me over your pastor, you're making a mistake. And he should be getting his message from the Holy Spirit, from God himself, not from somebody 3,000 miles away. But I still, every teacher has their following. So all it takes is to allow a teacher, no, no matter how much you like him, no matter how much you care about him, but if you let him stay in there and put false doctrine, yep. start kneading sin into the pure word of God and do it so subtly that you maybe can't recognize it at first, but then later on when it's almost too late, you realize that's why you have to root it out. Even though he's, and I've known, I have known churches. You say that, on, I have known churches where there were men and women of God that would not root out the evil or the sin or the false teaching because of the admiration they had for that person. And so sin climbs into the church. That's why there has to be that kind of five minutes. I got five minutes. So, all right, we're going to have to pick this up next week. But it's very important. That's why there has to be uh, accountability in the church. There has to be. So, and, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just cover a couple of small things and we'll pick up next week where it says Christ's character is revealed. The things like Mary becomes the central figure, chanting. Because, yeah, you are taught these ritual chantings, which are still done today. Uh, because, well, of course, today, because a few years later, we'll talk about this next week, uh, there is an opening where the Word of God is opened up to all people. And when that happens something like 13 million Catholics at that time uh, start proclaiming that they have been born again. And, I, and, and, God, and, and God be my witness, I wish there were millions of them. But they, even though they stay where they're at, they do not follow the sacraments, they do not follow, worship Mary, they follow Jesus Christ. So that ritualistic chanting... God never meant for that to be a form of worship. You worship God in spirit and in truth. Isn't that what the Bible says? So that Mary becomes more of a central figure, and she literally, in this age, becomes more almost, to, well, actually really exceeds Christ as far as how prominent she is in the church. But Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 says, In everything, Christ has the supremacy. Um, the crucifix, well known in Roman form of worship, uh, again, speaks of continual sacrifice. But Jesus himself said when he died on the cross just before, it is finished. He is not on that cross anymore. He is not paying a continual sacrifice. His once for all sacrifice was sufficient in the eyes of God. Amen. And he is now our high priest. And he is the living one, he proclaims in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and hell. So this is not a savior that is being continually sacrificed. Amen. He is alive, he is well. And what he did on the cross and at the grave, that was sufficient to save you today if you'll accept Christ as your Savior. All right, we're going to stop right there, folks. Uh, and uh, next week... We're... I have to read Heather's comments. This is awesome. Okay, go ahead. She says, I never understood why they would worship Mary over Jesus. I'm like, people, please read the Bible. <laughs> Yes, but that's it. But again, Heather, let me answer that quickly for you. Remember I told you that 
and, and go, I have to go back and look in the date, but tradition becomes just as important 1545. as, what, when is it? 1545. In 1545, the Roman Catholic Church rules that tradition is just as holy and important as the Holy Scriptures. So that is passed down in teaching just like the Scriptures is. So you don't even think about, but again, when you compromise, when you add something that's not supposed to be there, eventually the good, I mean, how long do you think Jesus is going to stick around if you constantly bring in paganism and worship it over him? See what I'm saying? So it becomes a part of the tradition. It becomes as holy as anybody else. And so if the Pope who's infallible tells you that Mary, the mother of God, is important and, and actually exceeds Christ, you, as a faithful Roman Catholic, are going to buy that hook, line, and sinker. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happens. And a lot of things that are happening are just... And let me help you before you Baptists get carried away. Your denomination and your church is loaded with tradition, and you don't even realize it. We do things that stopped working years ago, but we still do them for the sake of tradition. Mm -hmm. Just be, so be careful, you know, be careful in, in criticism. I'm always, I'm, I'm saying this because it's true, but tradition pays a huge part in all forms of worship today. And, and if we would look at the word of God, we would find out that some of those traditions that we believe in, we need to get rid of. So, yeah, it's getting close. But that was a great comment. But that's why. It's because it's been brought down through the ages. It's just like, well, never mind. I don't want to, I don't want to get people up. You're out of time. All right, I'm out of time. All right, it's been great. And we will come back next week at 9 o'clock, and we will talk about Christ's character revealed. And we're going to find out what Christ has to say to this church not only in 80, 90, 100, but also all the way down in the 1500s and the church that is coming in the future. Uh, God bless you. We love you. Thank you for joining me this morning. Now at 11 o'clock, the Rouge Free Will Baptist Church will be worshiping. Uh, you can go to church physically. The doors open about 1040 you asked to answer a few questions. Please put your mask on in your car. Wear it throughout the process, into the service. Wear it throughout the service. Please don't take it off till you get back in your car at the end of the event. And then if you can't go to church, then we are live streaming on Root Services on our Facebook page or Root Services on YouTube. And you can worship with the church live in your home. God bless you, and we are so grateful. Remember, we'll be right back with you here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for some praise and worship. So uh, send your, if you have questions, just put them on the scroll, and I'll answer them as quickly as possible, or you can text me. We love you. Let's worship God together, and God bless your day. Bye now.